I would preface my invocation with just a brief tale. Four years ago, I was asked to speak during Holocaust Remembrance Week in Mannheim, Germany. The chaplain who introduced me told me this story. Her father had fought his way into the death camp. He had encountered fierce resistance from the fanatical SS unit that was trying to maintain it, defend it. And he was exhausted, and he laid down his weapon and leaned against a brick building. And immediately he recoiled in pain. His hand was severely burned. You can imagine what was on the other side of that brick wall. To this day, that old soldier, whenever he looks upon his hand, the scars on the palm, says to himself, I will do everything in my ability, everything possible. Whenever I encounter racism, bigotry, or anti-Semitism, I will do my best to deter it. Almighty God, for Jews, the most central prayer to you is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In articulating this prayer, we witness that you are unique, unique in your unity, unique in your holiness. The Holocaust was your antithesis unique in the magnitude of its evil, unique in the quality of its evil, unique in that just yesterday as the nation dedicated a Holocaust museum, there were those present, along with others elsewhere in our nation and the world, who deny that the Holocaust ever occurred. May the scars of complicity that humanity bears like the scars on the hand of that old soldier, inspire us not only in words, but in actions, so that such evil, such bestiality, as anti-Semitism, genocide, racism, bigotry, and ethnic cleansing be banished forever from the face of the earth. And let us say, Amen. I'll return. Please be seated.
In a diary dated July 15th, 1944, a young girl wrote, it's really a wonder that I haven't dropped all my ideals because they seem so absurd and impossible to carry out, yet I keep them. I simply can't build up my hopes on a foundation consisting of misery, confusion, and death. I can see the world is gradually being turned into a wilderness. I hear the ever-approaching thunder which will destroy us too. I can feel the sufferings of millions. And yet, if I look into the heavens, I think it will all come out right. In the meantime, I must uphold my ideals, for perhaps the time will come when I shall be able to carry them out. The little girl who wrote these words was Anne Frank. She was murdered later that year in a concentration camp. It is fitting today, 50 years from that time, when the tide began to turn against the axis that we remember the victims of the Holocaust. But it's also fitting that we act to carry out the ideals and Craig expressed so well. The Secretary of Defense has encouraged our military commands to observe the days of remembrance as part of our country's national effort. For 10 years, ceremonies to mark the occasion have been held throughout the nation on Navy ships, at military bases and stations throughout the world. The Holocaust will forever save as a serve as a reminder of the values that we cherish, but we can lose so easily, and which we in the Department of Defense are pledged to uphold. Human dignity should not be decided on the battlefield in the hearts of men and women. Today we're honored to have the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable William J. Perry, to join us. Dr. Perry, of course, is no stranger to the building. He served in the Carter Administration as Director of Defense Research and Engineering. Since that time, his accomplishments and professional involvements are numerous. Before returning to defense, he was Chairman of Technology Strategies and Alliances, a professor at Stafford School of Engineering, co-director of the Stanford Center for International Security and Arms Control. It's a pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you very much, Doc. It is a privilege and an honor, indeed, to be here for our days of remembrance observance and to introduce our guest speaker, our armed forces have special reason for conducting these ceremonies because of our role in liberating Hitler's death camps. We are proud of that role and in our actions in bringing comfort as well as freedom to the survivors of the death camps. We rightly celebrate many major battles won by our military forces, but certainly the liberation of the concentration camps stand as a high point in the history of the United States military. We want to remember the Holocaust today, not just because of what it tells us about the past, but because of what it tells us about the future. Lewis Carroll had one of his characters say, it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. Well, we've got a poor memory if we only look backward today. We need to look forward as well. We remember the terrible events of 50 years ago because they remind us of why we cherish our freedom and individual rights. And they remind us of the critical force, the critical role of US military forces in the defense of these ideals. Because we're charged with maintaining our armed forces, I thought it was particularly appropriate that we give some thought to the events of the Holocaust and to what they mean for the future defense of the ideas of freedom and the idea of individual rights. To help us do that today, we are pleased to welcome Major General Giora Rahm. 
Holocaust, of course, has a particularly profound meaning to the state of Israel. And we're fortunate to be able to hear General Rahm's perspective as a representative of that country. General Rahm is the Israeli defense attache to Washington and a distinguished career officer in the Israeli Air Force. One Israeli pilot described General Rahm this way. He said, it was my first war, and it wasn't an easy one. Pilots were being killed. In such situations, people look for a leader. General Rahm is a born leader, very charismatic. Pada went on to say that with General Rahm, we all knew that someone was taking care of us. During the Gulf War, General Rahm played a key liaison role with the U.S. Armed Forces. Please join me in a warm welcome for General Rahm. It is 1961, and I'm a student at the 11th grade of my high school. In fact, I learned at the military boarding school. And this is the year of the Adolf Eichmann trial. There is no television in Israel, so we are all sitting, listening to the opening session of the Eichmann trial. And then we go back to school, And during the afternoons, from time to time, we are listening to the testimonies from the Holocaust. Either the afternoon testimonies or the morning ones. And one day, we are sitting about 25 young men at the age of 17, who have never spoken about the Holocaust, practically denied it deep inside. And there is the testimony of a woman <clears throat> telling the story about standing behind the truck on which uh, her two teenager sons are being taken. She's screaming and the German guard stops the truck and turns to her and tells her, well, lady, you can pick one of them. I don't know how many of you read William Styron's Sophie's Choice. Not like Sophie in that book, the woman didn't pick <clears throat> none of the two uh, sons. And <clears throat> when it was over, one of us, who was very silent, stood up and <clears throat> all of a sudden said, I, I cannot take it anymore. <clears throat> then he went out. Deputy Secretary Perry, General McPeak, General Mundi, distinguished member of the Pentagon, it's a great honor for me. And I was deeply moved by the opportunity that I had to speak on this very special event. I'm serving, I've been serving in this country for 10 months, and you can imagine I've spoken quite a few times, but never did I have such an opportunity to speak in, in something which is different. Usually I represent my government, I represent my country. This time I feel that I represent not only my country and my government, I represent my generation, I represent my parents' generation, I think that I represent my wife, who is here, who has spent her first six months as a baby in some remote forest in Czechoslovakia, Czech Czechoslovakia taken care by nuns. I represent the generation of my grandparents, who believe that Warsaw and Radonsk in Poland is a safe haven. 
I think that I present many other generations and maybe we'll see later, maybe I represent the generation of my children and of my grandchildren who have not yet been born. I had the feeling when I was approached to speak about the Holocaust and the Israeli spirit that expectation was that Israeli spirit and forgive me for using this expression supposed to be the bright side of the Holocaust an Israel general will come and speak about well life is not that bad anymore I, I think that I'm going to be to make it a little bit more complicated I'm going to speak about the Israeli spirit. And let me start by trying to summarize what is, when I say Israeli spirit, of course, I speak about what makes Israel unique compared to other nations. And I think that if I want to summarize it, Israeli spirit is consisted of deep, constant anxiety consists of feeling of isolation, feeling loneliness at moments of truth, consists of very powerful resolve, unbreakable determination, and I guess pursue for excellence as a way of life. I will need to put forth a number of historical comments in order to, com to connect modern Israel as a whole and Israel of 93 with the, with the tragic events that occurred in Europe during the 30s and the 40s. Where shall I begin? <clears throat> Maybe I'll begin by saying that the secular side of the Jewish community in Europe called Zionism was born in the middle of the 19th century as part of the nationalism wave that was born in that continent. In fact, much before the Holocaust, there were very famous five waves of immigration to Israel. My father came to Israel in 1925 as a teenager, as did my mother five years later, while Hitler was still a non-personality trying to write his Mein Kampf, maybe paint some paintings in Austria. So there was no threat as much as there was a concept of trying to build the new kind of Judaism in Palestine. But there was no feeling of any pressure over time. The ascent of the Nazis to power marked the beginning of a process that, that would eventually later destroy the large demographic base upon which the Zionist movement and the Zionist dream rested process that known to us today as the Holocaust. What was the Holocaust in such a short kind of speech? It was a systematic annihilation of an entire people just because their specific religion. This extermination was a policy dictated from above, fully supported or almost completely fully supported by the majority of the people of Germany and at later stages by the majority of other European nations like Poland, Hungary, the Ukraine, 
Romania as well as other nations that fell under Nazi uh, occupation. In fact, when the Nazis came to power at the beginning, it was not annihilation what they have in mind. It was more an ethnic cleansing. They wanted to clean Europe from Jews, whom they perceived as a destroying element. For a very short while, there was the Madagascar plan, namely to move all the nine million Jews of Europe from Europe to the island of Madagascar, a plan which very rapidly proved to be unrealistic. Then Jews begin to be encouraged, if you want to call it encouragement, to leave Germany, of course, to leave everything, all their property, just to leave the country. There is a very famous book which also became a movie, The Voyage of the Dam, about a ship full of hundreds of Jews leaving Germany, looking for some safe haven, travel for months in the open seas, trying to port in Cuba, trying to embark here in this country, and at the end, coming back to Germany and all of uh, the passenger perished in the Holocaust. The lessons for the German was very clear. Nobody cares about the Jews. But as time went by, it was clear that ethnic cleansing is not a viable solution if you really want to clean Europe. And the move to genocide was almost inevitable. And in January 1942, in the Wannese conference, the decision was very clearly made, namely, we, the German, should systematically clean Europe by killing them from the Jews. And it became, if you want to call it, a logistical problem. How to run the deception? Jews, like many others, refuse to believe that the sun that they see every morning bring them as close as possible to, for the la to the last day. There was very complicated transportation problems, as you know. They have to solve it. They have to find solution with German ingenuity for massive extermination. So the cycle of big gas came into our life, and there was the problem of disposing of the corpses. And they put very efficient German people to do it, beginning a process through which six million people, 1.5 million out of them were children, seized their life. The genocide of the Jews was, was one of the most important goals of the Nazis. And in fact, it reflected the world view. Toward the end of the war, when Germany became to come under pressure, and there was shortage of resources, they cut resources every place, but in the ongoing machine of extermination. And when there, when there was a question about who will be priori prioritized, trains to the, to the camps or trains to the Eastern Front, trains to concentration camp got priority. Money was not an object, transportation was not an object, the goal should have been achieved. In the outer circle, there was, no, there was not a lot of help. The Allies, which began to learn more and more about what was going in Europe, decided not to allocate any military resources to try to stop it or to slow it down. 
no bombing of the camps, no attacking of the, tra of the trains, no sabotaging the railways. Even when something which is known in our history as trucks for blood, namely a deal to try to save the Jews of Hungary for 10,000 trucks was considered, there was a complete refusal on the side of the British to supply these trucks in order to save over 100,000 Jews of Hungary. I, I try to think what a Jew could have felt over these three horrible years. Anxiety seems to me to be too weak a word. Maybe fear, maybe desperation, maybe not knowing what will happen next. There were some desperate attempts at defense, most famous of which was the Warsaw Ghetto uprising 50 years ago. By and large, that was a wide sense of helplessness. There was nobody to turn to. So, six million Jews perished. 1.5 million Jews found themselves next to the end of the war, behind the Iron Curtain, and the rest were moved to disposition persons camps all over Europe, began to try to find a way to Palestine, understanding that Europe is not where you want to dwell. And it was possible to assume that after World War II, when the magnitude of the catastrophe will be revealed, that will be no problem. But in the three years in between 45 and 48, strange phenomena occurred. The British, who ruled Palestine during that time, didn't let the Jews to come to Palestine. Ships were intercepted in the high sea, turned back to Europe or to a new camps, not concentration camps, but camps in Cyprus. I guess that the most famous, but not a single one, story is the story of the Exodus, where 4,500 Jews dance on an old ship, try to make their way to Israel, stopped by the British, try to resist. The British stormed the ship, killed some of the Jews, and then turned the ship back to Europe, all the way to Hamburg, to what I called the displaced person camp. While trying before the fear, the desperation, the anxiety, the loneliness, the helplessness, I guess that in Palestine, what is now Israel, what was developed through this year was very deep resolve. We have to have our own country. We have to take care of ourselves. We cannot expect anybody else to assist us. And we declare our independence in May 1948. While it was still very early, according to most of the people who lived during this time. And immediately afterwards, we found ourselves in an 18 months of war against seven Arab armies and irregulars with embargo, strange enough embargo from the United States while getting some help from the Soviet Union, the irony of history, and losing through these 18 months 1% of our population. as to lose about 1.5 million Americans during World War II.
And then one day the war was over and all of a sudden there is new Israel. During the 50s I was a child. I didn't know anything about the Holocaust. I thought that I was raising in a normal country. I learned lately that I was living through a very intensive melting pot in which we have multiplied our population trying to expand our demographic basis from, but with Jews from Iraq, from North, from North Africa, from elsewhere, just to build the Jewish population so Israel will be able to build itself. And we felt that we build new Israel. We didn't really know who are all these strange people with the six-digit number tattooed on their arms. We knew that there is some black hole behind them. We didn't want to know very much about it. And we thought, as many times in life you believe, that history is history and let's look forward. I guess that two events returned all of us to square one. And while growing up, we began to understand that we carried the Holocaust like a ball on a chain on our foot. The first event was the Six Day War. It took three weeks before Nazer began his move, not fully controllable, and until we attack his Air Force on Monday morning, 7.45. Through these three weeks, the different, different layers of defense of Israel fold one after the other. The United Nations, just by a word of Nazer, evacuated Sinai without even consulting with the government of Israel. We sent our foreign minister, Abba Ibn, to our greatest ally of that time, France. And he was almost literally kicked out of the goal office, told not to dare to do anything but sitting back. He flew then to Washington, trying to look for a document about some assurances of free free passage through the Straits of Tehran in the south part of Israel. There was a problem about that document. It was, not for, it was not found for 24 hours. But when he left Washington, what he had was President Johnson's message, do whatever you can do. You are on your own. I was a young pilot a lieutenant in the Sixth Day War, I couldn't understand the anxiety of the older generation. I couldn't understand why our very beloved Prime Minister, Levi called tattered when he spoke to the nation over the radio, thus creating a movement to create a national uh, security government, unity government. I couldn't understand why did they prepare in Tel Aviv thousands of graves. I really had my mirage and I felt very, very safe. So when we went to the war with all the resolve that was built within us, it was clear to us that we should win. In fact, the Yom Kippur War, which is remembered as a non-very successful war, we lost quite a few planes. In the first day of the Six Day War, we had more losses in the Air Force than in the Yom Kippur sec in the, in the uh, 
first two days in the Yom Kippur War. We lost 9% of our fighter air force. But everyone went with the determination that it's make or break. And even Lieutenant Dan Engel went there to the Egyptian base of Inchas. And while diving from 6,000 feet, we used to dive from 6,000 feet and to drop the bomb from 1,500 feet, he was exploded above the runway. <clears throat> and he was the guy who left the room during the Eichmann trial when he said, I cannot take it anymore. <laughs> so there is no surprise that the day after the Six Day War, there was a transition for a sense of impending doom, maybe another Holocaust, to some euphoria of a feeling of rebirth or redemption, maybe omnipotency, something that had a lot of impact on the Israeli character led us to make a lot of smart and not so smart moves ever since. Nine years later, at July 76, when this country celebrated the bicentennial, there was the hijacking of the plane to Entebbe. Well, as you know, planes have been hijacked before, hijacked later. Maybe they will be hijacked in the future. But that was the only case where after being hijacked, the 250 passengers were taken to the hall and then separated to two groups. 150 passengers to the right and the 100 Jews to the left. Exactly the Holocaust era selection process. Not necessarily Israelis. There were 70 Israelis. There were 30 Jews from other countries. But it was the same. The whole, all the 100 Jews were taken to the left side. The 150 were flown back to Paris. I don't come to tell you about the Entebbe uh, operation. It, it's well known. The only thing I can say is that there was no one in Israel who was part of the plan, the preparation, the thinking that was not ready to do anything. And we had initiatives from different units to do everything. Our SEALs from the Navy, they came with the idea to parachute to the, uh, to the Victoria Lake with small dinghies trying to come to go there to fight. Our patriots came forward. So it makes no difference what operation was carried out at last. Everyone in the military was ready to take part without regard regarding his own fate. I tried to think what enabled us to go through the Six Day War, through the Entebbe operation, and I think that we have developed some tendency of pursuing for excellence. We began that process in the middle of the 50s when we found out that we begin to accumulate failures in our military. Small ones, but very significant. And we decided that, that no achievement is, be, is good enough no effort is great enough. No goal will be out of reach. And we injected it into our armed forces day and night. We felt that every morning or every time we do something, the fate of the nation, the moral of the people is on everybody's shoulder. And if I can recall again, the Six Day War. We have sent all our air force to attack the Egyptian air force. We kept only 12 mirages for Israeli air defense. 
four on each one of the three bases that we had. I was in the middle base of Israel, in the first pair. So in the middle, we were told that we are for the defense of Tel Aviv. We are four mirages. There was no second tier or third tier. Or, these were the, f the four of us. Eitan, who was my leader, I was number two. Abram, who was number three, and Shmuel was number four. These are the four names that protected Tel Aviv in the morning of July 5th. So when you pull the harness, you feel that you put all your nation on your back. Broadly speaking, I think that the pursuit of excellence has to serve first and foremost the most important principle of Israel's security perception. We must be independent in the face of threats that have an existential character. We were very fortunate over the last 25 years to be the United States allies practically. We have received more of our, most of our weapon system from the United States. We have received a lot of technology. We have received the aerial security supply during the Yom Kippur War, and much more than that. And still, we want to be independent when it comes to existential threat. We were not provided with air refueling, for instance. But we felt that since Israel sees itself as responsible for Jews all over the world, as much as we can go, we have to develop our own capability. And we have developed that extended range flying. And we use it in Iraq, and we used it when we had to fly with F-4 to escort when the sun rose. The C-130s that flew back from Entebbe. And we used it when we went to attack the PLO headquarters in Tunis, a flight that I had the privilege to lead. And we used it in many other times when there was a need not to serve the expansionism of Israel as the Arabs blame us from time to time, but to protect ourselves and to protect Jews as far as we can. We are grappling now, for instance, how to protect ourselves against ballistic missiles in the next decade and afterwards. How should we relate to the question of early warning? Should we be the United States clients or should we make every effort to achieve that independence? If surface-to-surface -surface missiles with non-conventional warheads become a real existential threat, we want to be independent. I want to say a word about the relationship between ourselves and our neighbors or maybe the interpretation, the Israeli interpretation to the Arab animosity. We have taken years, for years, the words face value. When they said that they want to throw us into the sea, we believe them. We believe them. We knew that there is a kind of asymmetry in the Middle East in which if we win, we don't risk their political entity. But if they win, we believe that we will be thrown into the water. There will be no Israel anymore. We will begin another cycle of 2,000 years. And it took very outstanding, unusual move by the late President Sadat to try to convince us that w we can live together. We can find some coexistence by coming to Jerusalem, by landing with an Egyptian plane in Ben Gurion airport, by speaking to the Knesset, 
President Sadat convinced us that we may relax a little bit, which is what we are looking for. The current peace negotiations do not carry the same character. There is no outstanding move. There is no visit to Jerusalem. The negotiation with Syria, a kind of bargaining process as of now. So we still engulf with our traits as I have as I have described them in the beginning, we feel we are not safe enough. So what is the Israeli spirit that emerged from the Holocaust? Externally, it's the pursuit for excellence, the development of independent capabilities, maybe original thinking, some kind of ingenuity, there is some chutzpah, if you want, and very deep determination. Actually, it's a cover. It's a cover for living with a feeling with constant isolation, deep-seated anxiety, sometimes exaggerated, maybe. Afraid, not afraid, but worried by the threats, every morning threats. A feeling of very deep obligation for the physical well-being, not the welfare, the physical well-being of the next generation and the generations afterwards. And together with this, I think that almost desperate need for friends. Friends who give a strong feeling of camaraderie, a feeling of partnership. I think that in addition, there is a high level of sensitivity for human lives, or for the laws of life, be it Israelis, Jews elsewhere, or all other innocent people who are killed without cause and without committing any crime anywhere in Europe and in other places in the world. So we hope that 1993 will be an historic year of peace. <clears throat> Our Arab counterparts should understand that we want peace, but that we carry with us the tragic history of the Holocaust. We do not we cannot take our security concern lightly. So while we seek to make progress in the negotiations, we will simultaneously continue our pursuit of excellence in order to guarantee the future of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. Thank you very much. this afternoon by asking Chaplain Dressen to deliver the benediction. We have heard the words. We see the ghostly images. They sear our minds. They tear at our hearts. During the Holocaust and now, we ask not, where were you, eternal God? But we ask, where was man? May the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, and above all else, the works of our hands be acceptable to you, O Lord. Then and only then 
shall we be able to say, never again, never again, never again. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you all for coming this afternoon.